Okay, so good afternoon. Now I'm switched aside on to talk. So welcome. Um, I will present you something about flying reptiles today. Flying reptiles called pterosaurs are a very interesting group and I was approached by my co-author David Hone a few years ago um, and he was saying, well, you do all these isotope stuff. What about the diet reconstruction? There's so many uncertainty and even controversy about what the pterosaurs were feeding on. So that's why the study came about. And I will present you today some, well, the first comprehensive study of stable isotope analysis of pterosaurs. And, but before I'm doing so, um, I want to give an introduction about the stable isotope techniques briefly, what we do. And as you learned already, they are minimal invasive and they're semi-quantitative or even quantitative and allow us to infer something about feeding behavior. And that has been done broadly already for other extinct vertebrates in paleontology and in archaeology. And I want to do this today with pterosaurs. But before starting, I want to give you a short introduction about pterosaurs themselves. Um, pterosaurs, they are the first vertebrates that conquered air. So the first vertebrates that were able, of, capable of powered flight, even before birds. As you know, birds evolved in the late Jurassic, but pterosaurs, pterosaurs, they evolved even in the upper Triassic, like we do, the mammals, and they got extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. And you see here that they evolved from a kind of meter-sized or below meter-sized up to 12 meter size giant wingspan animals, which are very highly adapted to flight. And the first flying reptile was described by an Italian guy, but first of all recognized in 1801 by uh, Georges Cuvier, the French famous naturalist and paleontologist, as a flying reptile, basically, which is extinct because we don't have them today anymore. And they evolved to different bow plants, more or less similar. It's a bit strange looking, but that's not unexpected for an extinct animal, but they're very successful. Uh, and you see they are all able to fly, but they have different bow plants, even developing crests of bony or soft tissue, being sexually dimorph, um, and also capable to walk on land. Um, but they evolved to a high diversity of species, up to 130, even maybe 150 different ones. It's nice to illustrate in the book of Mark Witten, which I copied most of these nice figures from. Um, even this one, uh, this showing that we evolved here in the upper Jurassic and the biodiversity increased until the lower Cretaceous and they got extinct, but it declined already before in the late Jurassic and got extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So, and what about ecology? What were these guys living? Of course, they were flying, but not only uh, in the different habitats because they were found, the fossils were found in near coastal settings and pelagic oceanic settings, but also inland in freshwater settings. We'll come back to that later. They were uh, highly capable for flying, but also walking quadrupedally, some of them bipedally, we find track marks in the fossil record. Uh, looked a bit strange, but these days the reconstruction is that they walk on their wings as well. Um, and um, they evolved, developed, taking on from the top of Romain, from small eggs. They have been found recently, they have not been found for 200 years, but in the last few years, several eggs have been found. The soft shell calcitic, like the bird one, or like, like reptile ones, like from crocodilian ones, not hard shelled like for birds and they evolved from these eggs to either meter-sized or up to this biggest one here, Hatsidopteryx, 12-meter uh, wingspan-sized uh, giants. The giants are in the late Cretaceous, uh, amazingly big, but not very heavy, so maybe 200, 300 kilograms. They are light-weighted, um, so they're giants and dwarfs around. And what do we know about what they were eating? So most of it's based on the morphology. You see here different reconstructions to scale, to the same scale. And the hypothesis is mainly that they're piscivores, but maybe not from origin. Originally, they may be even chasing insects in the air and or fishing, um, but most of them are reconstructed as piscivores. That's the basic assumption, but some of them are insectivores, taxa, like this Orognatus, or some highly derived are also evolved to such filter feeding animals. Here they have like a baleen whale, some uh, tissues to filter out plankton maybe, um, but others like this one have a highly uh, massive dentition, which are maybe even used to crack crayfish or other hard stuff or hard shelled insects. And some are uh, terrestrial frugivores like, like this guy here, which have lost their teeth uh, and kind of beak like structures. What else has to be really as a hard evidence for this? Because the morphology of the skull is a major information, but sometimes we have rare stomach contents from these taxa, which are piscivores ones. Um, and um, here you see some different shapes of teeth, which are more kind of in line with insect feeding and other things. You can look at scratch marks and abrasion textures on the teeth, uh, which tell you that they have been eating hard stuff, but what exactly, we don't know. Um, sometimes you have 
rest of fish vertebrae or even parts of fish and stomach contents, which then definitely show that the last meal of these guys, at least were fish, but it's just a snapshot, the stomach content. Some have feeding tracks like this, which are peck marks, so <coughs> produced like this, so maybe a pterosaur is picking for food stuff around a riverbank or whatever. So this is what we have as current evidence of diet, which is mostly the morphology and of course some modeling of the biomechanics of the stability of the skull and all the flight capabilities and things like that. So there are of course these hypotheses and we want to add on the state livestocks to test them. If they're really piscivores like this recent reconstruction from the National Academy of Science report cover page which I just found and copied which is very nice. So they could either eat fish in freshwater settings like here in the Paleo Lake setting in the Lake Jurassic or the classic Pteranodon which is a well, the most best studied with more than 1,000 specimens, a pelagic ocean dwelling, um, soaring uh, uh, pterosaur, which is definitely a fish eater for sure, um, and has wingspans of whatever, five to seven meters. And so basically, this is the current status, the phylogeny of the pterosaurs, especially the pelagic there. They have here the more um, basal ones, the Morphodontidae. Uh, down to Astrachidae, which are the late Cretaceous, uh, Cretaceous forms, and you see the blue bars representing mostly marine feeding, I'm not saying what exactly, but most likely fish. For some of this, we have stomach, stomach contents, like here the Pterodonodids or the Rumphorynchus or uh, others. Some probably were feeding in freshwater environments, maybe fish and or other aquatic animals, and some derived forms here, the Tapajaridae or the Astrachidae, they are presumed terrestrial feeders, maybe frugivores. Um, based on the place where they're found and also the skull morphology of uh, these kind of uh, toothless uh, skulls. So that's where we stand. So what we want to do is then, using isotopes, the both classical one, the traditional ones, the carbon isotopes and the oxygen isotopes, to assess the diet of these extinct flying reptiles. And the good thing is that we are independent of taxonomy and morphology. The isotopes just tell us stories, numbers basically we have to interpret, but they are based on isotope fractionations, so changes to isotope ratios, which we can link to processes, in this case, feeding on certain food types. Means diet with different carbon isotope signatures, and there's a very simple way of thinking. We have high delta 13 C values, and I will substantiate it further for marine feeders to be expected as a working hypothesis, and lower ones for terrestrial feeders, why I will come to in a minute. And for oxygen, we have the hypothesis that ingested drinking water is producing us lower 18O values in um, terrestrial and or freshwater feeders and higher 18 O values in marine and intermediate ones for extreme feeders. So that's basically the test hypothesis we want to work on, the working hypothesis. And so what is our archive for this? Of course we need hard tissues, soft tissues are gone. So our hard tissues are bones, which are made of this biomineral biapatite containing also some carbonate here in the crystal structure, which is not mentioned here, but I threw it verbally. And we have the collagen, which is already gone, the, the structure of protein, which is decayed in the fossil bone. And then we have the teeth, which are made of enamel and dentine. Uh, and the enamel is usually the material of choice for geochemists because it is the hardest vertebral tissue. It has very little porosity. Um, it has higher, uh, larger crystals of biapatite. And therefore, because of the little amount of organics, less than a percent, uh, the best preservation potential and least alteration prone tissue, which probably preserves best pristine original isotope compositions. However, the problem is that teeth are often not for certain taxa developed of the pterosaurs, so we have to deal with bone. And another advantage of bone is that bone is constantly remodeled throughout lifetime, so it's an average archive of the last years of food, whereas the teeth may, depending on the tooth formation, only reflect the last months, maybe years, depending on the species. Okay. So what did we analyze? We uh, asked different colleagues and, uh, from different museum collections uh, to get us fossil specimens provided, mostly bones and teeth, and we ended up with amazing many in the end. We started as a kind of test study, first of all, but then we had up to 36 specimens in total from these eight main groups of um, pterosaurs comprising 18 taxa mentioned here. Uh, I don't want to go and bother you with the names in detail. So but basically we had a Wow. a big gunshot across the phylogeny of different pterosaurs from different Earth periods, from the Jurassic and from the Cretaceous, from different settings, marine and aquatic. So it's kind of a, well, we look what we find approach, but with based on the hypothesis looking what food and water sources these pterosaurs have used. 
for the food, we use the classical carbon isotopes. You know, there are two stable ones. We are not talking about the 14C, which is used for dating, which is radioactive, but the two stable ones. The light one is the most abundant, the 12C, and the 13C, the heavy one is less abundant, and you measure isotopically the isotope ratio in a mass spectrometer of a sample, 13C, 12C ratio. You normalize it to a standard, and then you get this classical delta 13C value, which is your notation that will also appear in all the graphs. You've seen that already in the other talks. So, and this can give us information about the carbon source means the diet which the pterosaurs have ingested. Um, and indirectly also about the foraging habitat, so if it was more marine or terrestrial. And this is where we stand in modern plants. Modern plants are the base of the food web. Um, here in the terrestrial plants, we have the common clear T3 plants, which have a mean value of minus 27 per mole. Uh, and they can vary, as you see in this histogram, depending on environmental factors. I'm going to look into detail here. And we have the C4 plants, which are mostly grasses, um, which have a value of about minus 13 per mole, which is heavier. And here you see the marine plants, the freshwater plants down here, but the marine plants are in this range. POM means particulate organic matter, so it's kind of the plankton. And you see the plankton varies spatially a little bit. We come back to it later, but they have values higher than the terrestrial plants. And you have the seagrass, which is quite high values. But both of them, these ones only exist since the late Miocene. We saw that in the other talk of Jeremy. So they're not present in the Mesozoic. And these ones only evolved in the Cretaceous, the seagrasses, which have these high values. So that means the pterosaurs were not feeding on these food issues. Uh, so the food webs are based on these three plants in the terrestrial realm and or the plankton here. So that means pterosaurs were ingesting this kind of carbon sources. And that means based on a terrestrial food web, we expect lower delta 13C values at the base of the food web. Then in the marine realm, we have higher, about 7 per mole higher or delta 13C values to expect in the plankton on average. So potentially there's a possibility to distinguish terrestrial versus marine feeding on a broad scale. So uh, excuse this slumpy dinosaur, which is old fashioned reconstruction, but I had not time to update that. But basically what I want to show is this. So how is the carbon coming into the animal? Basically simply it's eating these kind of plants, probably gymnosperms, maybe starting angiosperms in the Cretaceous, and they are metabolized by the pterosaur or the animal, and then you produce bicarbonate dissolved in the blood. And from that, at body temperature, you form your skeletal appetite. You buy appetite either a bone or a tooth, which contains this appetite <coughs> biomineral. Uh, and in this biomineral, there's a certain fraction of a few weight percent of carbonate incorporated in the crystal structure. Uh, and there, this carbon is a dietary carbon from the plant or animal matter that this animal has eaten, and you can measure the isotope composition of this carbon fraction. The question is then, how we come from that to the diet? Well, this is the current knowledge from the literature. So this is the offset between black here, the diet value, and the value we measure in our heart tissue, bone, or if not mentioned, it's bone or enamel, and if it's mentioned here, then it's eggshell. So we have a fractionation, so that means we have an enrichment of carbon, 13 along the process of formation of actual and or bone. And this is different, as you can see, for different animals, depending on the digestive physiology. Um, and this is the case because uh, you see plant feeders, they have a higher enrichment in potency. That means they um, produce during metabolism CO2, which is certain C enriched. C -enrich, uh, and this produces the bicarbonate from which the bone of these forms or the actual it is more enriched in feed than for carnivores, which are protein feeders, mainly. So we have a distinction. So the best assumption is that we probably have an animal feeding pterosaur, not a plant feeding pterosaur. So these red ones, these red values are probably appropriate as an assumption for the fractionation between diet and biotype for a pterosaur. So that means for a pterosaur, we assume a value of 9 per mil, plus 9 per mil, as a difference between the diet and the bioappetite. So, and this is schematically shown here, modified after leaf thought, you see the vegetation value at the base of the food web, either marine or terrestrial, is this X value, and then we add in the bioappetite plus 14 per mole in plant feeders, but in our case, because we have a piscivorous as a hypothesis or <coughs> animal feeding pterosaur, we add 9 per mole, so this is about the fractionation to be expected, and if that's true, then we use this value to back calculate the dietary data for value of the diet ingested by we come to that back later. So that's the foundation. So to characterize the diet for the oxygen, we can characterize the water composition, as we learned already. Oxygen has three stable isotopes, but classically the 18 
the least abundant and the highest abundant 16 are measured. Again, relative to the standard, kind of to up the delta 18 O value. This reflects the delta 18 O value of the body fluid value, it reflects the value of the drinking water. That's what we want to do and reconstruct to infer the feeding habit in the, in the sense of it was feeding in fresh water or in marine water. We learned also that it's in thermometer, but this is not important in this case because probably the body temperature of the pterosaurs was presumably constant. They were homeotherms, maybe even endotherms. They have fur, they have higher growth rates, and uh, bone type, which is typical of fast growing warm blooded animals. So probably we just have a record of drinking water mainly in the oxygenized body composition of the bio. And this differs, and this varies, this oxygenized body composition between fresh water and seawater due to fractionation processes. They are called Rayleigh fractionation. What happens is the ocean globally has a constant value today about zero per mil, in the past maybe minus one, with highest free poles. And then we have evaporation from the ocean, which depletes the delta 18 O value, means the water vapor is depleted in 18 O, it's more O16 rich. And during precipitation, again, when we rain out proportionally more, the heavier. 18O, but still the 18O value of the rain, the first rain that falls on the ocean or on the coast is depleted in 18O, and this progrades more inland to more lower values, so that means fresh water is usually depleted in 18O compared to marine waters. So we can distinguish fresh water from marine water, and this um, is nicely shown in this graph. It's called the isoscape, an isotope distribution map. Globally, modern values from precipitation measured Global ocean, zero per mil, if you measure here in Hawaii or in Alaska or whatever, um, doesn't matter. It's the same, more or less, plus minus one per mil. And, but if you are inland in hot and dry settings, you have low values. And if you are in the polar regions, you have even lower values. Uh, so you have a latitude dependent decrease. This increasing latitude delta 18 over in precipitation decreases due to decreasing temperature. And this can be incorporated, and it depends where you are foraging as an animal. In low latitude settings and high latitude settings, the difference between this value and the ocean value would become larger. So basically, that's what is our working hypothesis. We have a pterosaur flying around maybe near coastal areas, more on or offshore, we don't know. But basically, what we expect is then, if this is a fish eater in the open ocean, we should ingest the water mainly from seawater. And there are measurements on modern seabirds that the blood delta 18 O value compares very well to the seawater value. Or if you would feed on fish in a freshwater setting, then you should have delta 18 O values in the body fluid at least minus 3 per mil around or less, depending on the water composition of the water body in land. And this is incorporated at a constant body temperature, so uh, that means we have, because the fractionation of constant body temperature fractionation is constant, that means the oxygen isotopic composition of the water is recorded in the blood, is recorded in the heart tissue from which bones and teeth mineralize. Okay, so this is the basic foundation, but then the question for the fossils is, as we heard already in other talks, is what we measure still the original composition recorded during lifetime? Is it recording still the water composition of the drinking water? So we have to test this. One approach to do this is compare the carbonate oxygen and the phosphate oxygen, because both are in the same biappetite recorded, and there's a certain offset between them, and this is because we have a linear relation for modern mammals between the two, the oxygen of the carbonate and the oxygen of the phosphate, so we should ideally fall in this regression line. We do fall sometimes close to it, but many points fall off to the lower side. And the location that diagenesis preferentially attacks the carbonate fraction, which is the minor fraction, and is more easily to be altered during fossilization process. That seems to be the case, but the phosphate oxygen seems to remain in the same range of values. Um, so probably this is preserved. And what is down here is then a freshwater setting, same thing, maybe diagenetic trend towards here and still maybe the phosphate oxygen there. Although there are also cases for phosphate oxygen alteration, so one has to be careful, but still this is the presumption that it's more robust and probably still even bone preserved. Okay, if you like, look at the data then, that's a piece of graph, I know, but simply you have here the phosphate oxygen on the y-axis, and here you have all the different pterosaurs against time from the late Cretaceous back to the early Jurassic. Schematically shown, freshwater value is expected here in the lower range, of delta 18 O phosphate values, marine ones higher. And what you see that you fall mostly here in the upper range of kind of transitional values between marine and freshwater ones. Clearly those ones here, the Zumbaripterus, they have low values. They come from a lake setting, a paleo lake setting that fits very nicely. We have still the low 18 O values here, a few per mil lower than what we usually have. Usually we have values around 19 to about 22 per mil. And you see a large range here in the Tapajara. This is interesting. 
Um, the total range is about nine per mil, but here this one is about two per mil in a single species. So that means obviously this Tapajara species, which is a presumed terrestrial feeder, uh, maybe even a frugivore, he has covered at least two per mil of 18O variability in the water that he ingested. So that means he could not only have lived on marine settings, but obviously also has ingested some lower delta 18O water from terrestrial settings. So that fits nicely to the feeding hypothesis somehow. Um, and others are more in the range of the marine uh, setting, which is here color coded as a dark blue, which are the samples found in marine strata, and light blue, those samples found in freshwater, presumably freshwater deposits. Okay, but then what is the comparison with modern values? Well, it's again a busy graph, and I try to figure out what we can use as comparative samples. Flying reptiles are no birds, but they are archosaurs, as we learned, so they are in this range. So the best comparison of a modern animal would be, because pterosaurs are extinct, birds. Okay, for birds, we don't have money, not, not much data for bones, not many data for bones or teeth, because they have no teeth. So only we have bone data, but instead of bone data, I use from the literature these ones from eggshell. Assuming that eggshell carbonate, oxygen, like bone, oxygen also reflects drinking water compositions. These blue dots are from these marine species, from modern marine species from uh, the San Diego area in the US and from Puerto Rico. And we see that marine feeders, the more pelagic they are, the higher the 18 O values are. And this is the variation within the same species. And you see there's well, not much variation going on, especially not in this one, because this is an anchovy feeder. Uh, and these ones are also highly piscivorous animals. And um, I compared as terrestrial animals, terrestrial raptors. I measured them myself. These are bone data from modern raptors from Germany. And you see they fall at lower values. And here these are reptiles, amos, uh, uh, ostriches, and cassowaries, and so on. And you see they also fall in the low 18O range. Um, and here are our pterosaur data. And you see the pterosaur data that nicely cover the ones of the modern seabirds, eggshell data. So, but they cover quite a range, even to some higher values, and these ones, of course, are freshwater 18O values, as we saw before, uh, and there's a certain gap in here. So that means we come in the range from 18O using different water sources from fully marine down to freshwater in these pterosaurs. Um, and, um, but we see also here some overlap with the terrestrial animals, but this is due to water stress, because these large, non-flying, non-volant uh, birds, they live in dry settings and arid settings, and evaporation means water stress can, can you bring to marine values, even in freshwater settings, by evaporating away the, um, the light oxidized composition somehow. Crocodilians, you see, they cover a huge range. I don't want to go in detail here, but this is based on different waters they're living in. Uh, also, evaporation influence at that end, and uh, these values are from freshwater crocodilians. Um, so there's a mixed story. It means oxygen gives us some information, and marine ones have higher values than terrestrial or bird ones. And if you look in this picture more on the phosphate oxygen again, um, this is modeled data. This is not the data I measured, but this is modeled data assuming a vertebrate drinking water at the polar latitude down to the equator and using modern data from measured precipitation values from this GNIP database uh, and using a model assuming the pterosaur behaves like a mammal, a warm-blooded vertebrate using the model of AMIO, calculating what the phosphate oxygen isotopic composition of the appetite would be. And the same here for a marine water drinking warm-blooded mammal. And we see a lot of scatter in the data, but this is due to evaporation effects or altitude effects, um, which are hidden here. The model curve itself is this. So that means if you are a terrestrial freshwater drinking animal, you should follow this curve. If you're warm-blooded and you're a marine water drinking animal, you should follow the blue line. Um, and if we look then in the real data, which is then shown here, then we saw we see that the blue dots, which are the pterosaurs, they fall in between. Um, and if you compare them to dinosaurs, this is two C enamel of dinosaurs from the studies of Romain. Uh, and we see then from different latitudes, okay, yes, even also a huge scatter, but this is because uh, they live in different evaporation influence settings. Of course, dinosaurs are fully terrestrial. They're not marine water using. And here the pterosaurs, they are often at the upper end or higher than the contemporaneous dinosaurs, but when it has to do that on a site basis, site-specific basis, that comparison, which I had no time to do, but here, just to give an overview, the values are in that range. So most pterosaurs come from middle latitude settings. Some of them have lower values, falling on the range of expected values for freshwater drinking, um, and others are more in between. Um, 
uh, close to the ones from the world that expected bringing fully marine water out. But of course, they ingested not the seawater, they try probably even if they feed on water, they may still ingest some water from uh, land based settings, especially then when they breed, they have to come back to lay their eggs on land, of course. They're not living fully aquatically, for sure. If you look then at the carbon, what is the picture in the carbon? In the carbon, if you look at the carbon isotopic composition against latitude and modern plankton, we see that from equatorial areas to polar areas, modern day ocean, we have a trend of decreasing values towards the higher latitudes. More so on the southern hemisphere than here on the northern hemisphere. On average, we have another difference between the plankton near, near the coasts and the plankton in the ocean itself. So that means you have a trend with latitude and you have a difference between coastal um, differences. So close to the coast, the values are higher than offshore. And this is the range to be expected in modern terrestrial sea three plants, no matter where you are at which latitude. So there is a difference about 7 per mil in delta 30 sea values between plankton on average and terrestrial carbon to be expected. Especially if you stay in low to mid latitude settings, which we are for the terrestrials. Okay, if you look then at the data, what you see, again, here's the carbon isotopic composition of the carbonate fraction in the bones and or T's. T's are always the triangles. Um, plotted here for the different species again from late Cretaceous back to the early Jurassic. Here, the higher values expected for carbon, which is more or less an isotopic equilibrium with marine DIC, and here with terrestrial carbon ingested on land or freshwater settings. And we see most of the values fall down here uh, in the simplified interpretation, although this must not necessarily 100% mean that they were feeding all on land, of course, as we see soon. But they have low delta 13 C values and much less so than these open squares. These open squares is the embedding sediment carbonate. And this is what marine carbonate would like, look like, these values here in the gray box. And this often is car uh, the carbonate embedding sediments falls in this box, but the bones and even the teeth are still below. What does it mean? That this does mean that the bones and teeth have not been shifted diagenetically completely back to these values, right? So it's a kind of measure that diagenesis at least has not uh, obliterated our original carbon isotope composition completely. Maybe it still inspires somehow, um, especially in cases where it's similar to the metrics, we don't know. But here at least, they're often different and lower in carbon uh, isotope composition than the metrics carbonate, which is nice, but still no proof for not alteration. Okay, and we see here the Tapajara again, which is a presumed terrestrial feeder, has a huge variation, huge range of delta 30 C values, which is about yeah, nearly the whole magnitude we have. So that means this animal had obviously, or this species has obviously eaten different carbon sources, uh, food from different carbon sources. Uh, others are more constrained. Um, and uh, these ones here obviously teeth from the same individual, bone from another individual. So there's a huge scatter as well, but maybe teeth they form to different periods, early in ontogeny, bone, time average, longer time period. So maybe there can be also dietary shifts in. Problem, as you see, sometimes we have only very low sample numbers, sometimes even only one per species. So we need more data to come to firmer conclusions about what they have eaten. But if we compare these carbon isotope data again, it's the same seabird, eggshell, carbon values, then we see again high values for the fish eating birds like these ones, especially very narrow distribution for the elegant term, which is a uh, anchovy feeder. Um, and um, these ones, which are feeding partially at least the western gravis also, in, which is this guy here, the western gravis who feeds in freshwater settings, has lower delta 13 sea values, similar like those from the modern raptors from Germany, as well as the, uh, some of the ostriches. But again, they have higher values, and this is the highest you can get. This is a water stressed C3 plant diet, you come up to minus eight per mil, not higher. So this is kind of due to water stress on the C3 plants. Um, these are other retites uh, from um, uh, in the, in the South America. And you see these are the terrestrial feeding C3 plant values to be expected. And this is the range that modern piscivorous bird actual values cover. And you see that the pterosaurs here, the black data points, they fall nicely in the range of marine piscivores. Um, few of them down here in the terrestrial three, three plant range and some even higher, which is not probably clear why, but this one is a special case. I don't want to discuss in detail, but the question I can tell you later why it's so high. Okay, and what have they really eaten then? So this is work in progress. I have not had 
enough time to compile the whole literature, but here's some ideas. This is the real values of the diet itself, not the carbonate, which I showed you before from the appetite, but it's back calculated delta 13 C values from the diet, the real diet that they have may have eaten. Modern plants, terrestrial ones, modern freshwater plants, the marine plankton, kelp, seagrass, and here you have the soft tissue of bivalves, squid, the soft tissue of freshwater fish, soft tissue of marine fish. Well, and this is the back calculated values from the pterosaur diet using this nine per mil fractionation, back calculating to the diet. And then we come here to this range. And you see, astonishingly or not, um, but for me in that sense, because I never did it before, except for this talk, I should have done earlier, you see there's quite an overlap between bivalve, squid, marine fish. But of course, the freshwater fish still has lower values. But again, I need to compile more data, make box, box plots and look at the means. But you can say, at least, it's difficult to distinguish a marine bivalve, squid, or marine fish feeder maybe, but all would be potential diets. We can't distinguish with carbon isotopes alone, but freshwater should have lower values. Freshwater feeding, piscivorous animals should have lower values than the marine one, which was all working at was still, and that's confirmed. So we have not many values here, so most of them are maybe more marine piscivorous and or feeding on other of these similar carbon isotope feedstuffs. Okay, so based on these preliminary data, I have to make a note of caution, of course. Uh, uh, the sampling design was not ideal. The working hypothesis are okay, but still we have low sample numbers. We need more specimens per species to really come to firmer conclusions. We need to better characterize still the digenesis, which is always an issue with bone, but sometimes we have only bone because pterosaurs lack teeth. This fractionation, I think, is relatively reasonable, well constrained, but still we can debate about it if it's the right assumption using this plus nine per mil offset for carnivores, uh, mammal, and or bird. And then we have to better characterize the dietary resources. But still, based on what we have as current evidence, I think we can say pterosaurs stay foraged at low latitude in freshwater and marine settings, based on the carbon and oxygen isotope data that we have. And these data are at least not in contradiction to Piscivory as the main dietary adaptation, but there is more than this. Um, but this needs to be isotopically better explored. What we can at least say, we can confirm that the Atsta feeds the most evolved Cretaceous ones, which lo lost their teeth and are presumed terrestrial feeders. Yes, so that fits. They have the largest variation in the certain C values and um, also low H and O values. And also Tabajara, which is a ter presumed terrestrial feeder, used H and O depleted water sources, meaning freshwater based um, ecosystems. So um, as a perspective, we can do more and should look at the intertoxin variability. We get some enamel samples if possible from specimens where with only teeth, uh, only bone samples so far. And we should better compare with uh, sympatric ecological um, well-known taxa like fish, dinosaurs, or others to see how they compare to pterosaurs to infer better but something about the diet. Uh, about, of the diet. And as a last thing, it's really something we should do. Uh, it's calcium isotopes because calcium isotopes are robust because we learned in the other talk they you need tiny amounts and calcium is the major element in bioappetite so alteration is not an issue. And there is a known trophic um, depletion of 44 relative to 42 calcium so we can distinguish herbivores from carnivores. The question is what about piscivores? We don't know yet, we need data. But some data we have seen about the sharks, there are some data or piscivores mammals. So we have to see if we can distinguish at least a terrestrial feeder from a piscivorous marine feeder because the marine food chain starts a trophic level higher basically because uh, the calcium isotopic composition at the base of marine food chain is different than a terrestrial one. So maybe you can distinguish terrestrial and marine feeders. Okay, so with that, I have to thank many, many people who supplied us with specimens uh, and also helped us in discussion and improving our ideas. Um, and funding was by the National German Science. Thank you.